So how appropriate that your song talks about shine love, shine. I like, uh, you know, some part of that that really speaks to me is that it almost sounds like I'm saying to myself, come on, love, shine, love, shine. And so, it, you know, it's, r it's really about us calling, calling ourselves, calling the love that is already there within us to step out and, and to be seen. And so I am going to be talking about that today. The title of my talk is, You Are a Love Story. Have you ever thought of yourself that way? One of my favorite phrases is that I am the love of my life. And I know that the more important I am to myself in, in that way, the, m the more love that I have to shine out and uh, to make a difference in, in the world. Now, the other part of, of the topic that uh, Centers for Spiritual Living is focusing on this month is ensuring the stewardship of our planet. And so the quality, the attribute of spirit, the truth of who we are, as love was chosen. So what I'm going to do is tie those two things together. But mostly, I'm going to be talking about love and our own love story, because I have more time this month to talk about the planet. And I think that we can all agree that the more connected we are with the love that we are, the more empowered we are to really make significant change and to live up to the stewardship of our planet that is our divine birthright. Now I had the opportunity as a um, Science of Mind student to have classes with Dr. John McEwen. And the Bible was a great, great love of his. He understood the metaphysical aspect of the Bible, that uh, the Bible is written on many different levels. The Bible is written on a historic level. It has a lot to tell us about what took place a very long time ago. And it's also written on the level of the spiritual teaching, the religion of the time. And whether you're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, there are two very, very different kinds of consciousness that are being taught through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, of course, we know that in the New Testament that the teachings of Jesus have come on the scene. And, you know, uh, when Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our teaching, was alive, when he would be out in the world, he would frequently be asked, what is, what is religious science based on? What is the teaching of the science of mind based on? And he would frequently say, it is based on the teachings of Jesus. Not the religion, necessarily, of Christianity. But the teachings of Jesus. Because he understood the spiritual psychology of what he was teaching. He understood it from the viewpoint of being one with the creator. No separation. That the qualities and the attributes of this thing that I call God, spirit, divine mind, infinite intelligence, the one presence, the one power, the one knower that is everywhere, right where I am as me, he understood that This went beyond 
any particular religious doctrine or dogma. And he also firmly believed, if you've, as, or as you've looked at the textbook, that it's done unto us as we believe. And I heard for years and years, every Sunday that I came in for service and sat there, it's done unto us as we believe, not what we say we believe, not what we think we believe, but what we really, really, really believe. Beliefs. And when beliefs become embodied, they fire, they happen, we create automatically out of those beliefs. Even if we don't know what the belief is. Isn't that the interesting, an interesting thing about beliefs? Now, we can, talk, we can talk about our values and be more connected, you know, about what we value. But our beliefs, the underlying root core of what is driving our life, is hidden. What is not hidden, what's not hidden, is the circumstances of our lives, the things that are happening. So the, one of the very early, early things of the Bible in Genesis that I think speaks very specifically to the idea of ensuring the stewardship of our planet is where God said that we've been created to have dominion over all the creepy, crawly things. All the things that are, um, are of lesser intelligence, and I don't mean that in any kind of a dismissive way, but things that, that operate on instinct. And things, all of these things, plants, animals, the sea. Yes, it's true that what we do to ourselves, we do to our environment. And by the same token, what we do to the environment, we do to ourselves. Now, I can get pretty reactive and charged up about that and forget that I'm a being of love. I can get all happy. I can th then I can swing to the other side and I can get all happy with the Beatles song. You're like, all you need is love. Da, 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 da. All you need is love. And I feel good and I can turn right around and I can move into criticism or judgment. So what that says to me is that when I focus on love and something reacts and responds and comes alive in me and I'm happy, that that is a life-giving energy that I want to cultivate and I want to have more of so that in the moment where I am faced with difficult situations and where I want to be an avenue for what is wanting to happen by means of me in terms of the actions that I take about the planet, the things that I value and what I'm going to stand up for and what is mine to do, I want those decisions to come from the place of knowing that I am love. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that love is a synonym for God, that God is love. We're talking about the kind, kind of love that is free from fear from condemnation that holds nothing and no thing against anyone or anything. We're talking about the kind of love that when Emerson said, said 
those that, or Jesus said, those that loveth not, know not God. And then Dr. Holmes wrote his definition of love in the glossary of the Science of Mind textbook, and he describes it as the self-givingness of the spirit of life through the desire to express itself as creation. So the visual that comes up for me around that is that I've been created in the image and the likeness of love, a love that is so difficult for my human finite mind to wrap itself around, but a love that there's no free fear, there's no condemnation. This Love, this universal creative power that is love, can only give of itself. It can't do anything else because that's what love does. It gives unconditionally. Now that's a message, isn't it? That, that says something to me. That if I'm going to be an avenue for this expression of love, the self-givingness of the spirit, that out of its self-givingness, you and I have been created. Everything that we see, the spiritual universe, the scientific universe, everything that holds everything together in perfect divine right action is an expression of this self-givingness of love. And within you, within me and within the planet, there is the intelligence that knows how to heal itself. But because we are stewards of the planet, we must align with this kind of love to make a difference. Now, there are, I, I want to mention that there are a couple of people who have been ins inspiration to me in putting this talk together. And one of them is Reverend Dr. Edward Vilhune of the Center for Spiritual Living in Santa Rosa. And I just so admire his, his messages and his mind and his vulnerability which is something I'm going to talk about. And the other person is Brene Brown. Brene Brown. And I, you know, I've been aware of these books, but the one recently that I got was uh, Dare to Lead. And so I've been reading her book, and I also had the opportunity recently, you know, how when you're online and videos and, you know, you watch, you're watching one thing and then all, there's all these things in the column. So there she was, and she was on the um, CBS morning show with Gail King and, um, and the others. And she talked about vulnerability, and that's all she talked about in terms, in terms of love. And she said, you know, I'm, uh, I am getting invitations to go and speak to some of the largest companies in the world. And she says, it's really interesting because when they call up, they say, yeah, we really want you to come and we want you to teach these leadership skills, but we don't want you to talk about any of that vulnerability stuff. <laughs> and she says, that's so interesting because 60% of my book is all about vulnerability. And so the tagline of the book, Dare to Lead, is learning how to cultivate effective leadership. Brene says, you can't have courage without vulnerability. That vulnerability is actually the path to courage. Now, I know that our global society needs courage 
in order to solve the problems that face us. Not just to fix them, not to argue about what are the best policies, but to be open to the best way globally for these very, very serious problems to be dealt with. Do you know her definition of vulnerability? Yes. Can I say it anyway? Okay. <laughs> her definition of vulner vulnerability is uncertainty. Are you living in any kind of uncertainty in your life? In any way? I am. Is there any area in your life where you're taking risks, where you don't know what the outcome is going to be? Can you see any areas of your life right now where taking risk might be beneficial? If you, or as you tap in to the divinity within you and know that what, you're what you are is a creative expression of spirit, and that what you have to share, and when you shine your light, it makes a difference in the world. Is it risky sometimes to shine your light? It is. So the definition of vulnerability, are you experiencing uncertainty? Are you... You, are there any risks that you're taking in your life? And do you feel exposed? Now, one of the things that she said in the interview is that, you know, a lot of the CEOs uh, think vulnerability means that, that whenever you meet someone that you just go, Bleh. <laughs> that you tell all, you share all. That's not what vulnerability. Vulnerability does not ask for disclosure. One of her most um, risky ventures where she felt uncertainty about what was going to happen, she knew she was taking a risk, and she was exposing herself was to go and talk to the military. And the military, on the surface, was saying, um, no, vulnerability does not lead to courage. No, vulnerability is not going to win the war. Vulnerability is not going to get the job done. And so she asked them, Give me a single example of courage that did not require uncertainty, risk, and exposure. She said there was dead silence in the room, long period of silence. And finally, one man spoke up and said, three tours, ma'am. There is no courage without vulnerability. We live in a time in our society. It's always been there, this aspect of fear. And I don't know if I'm just more sensitive to it or what, but right now, I think there's a huge aspect of fear. And Brene talks about the idea that fear is very contagious. But here's the thing. She says, yes, fear is very contagious. And apply this to yourself. But it has a short shelf life. It will only get you 
so far. And for those who have chosen to step on the spiritual path, I think the time that we spend in fear becomes less and less and less to the point that when we notice what prompts our behavior and the things that we do, if we can identify that it is fear, then we know that we are not being vulnerable. That we know we are making decisions based on, on not feeling safe. And that fear, which is false evidence appearing real and taking actions that are motivated by fear, will, act, will, will invariably bring upon us the things that we fear the most. And so we're called to step into our vulnerability, to step into the place of uncertainty, that we don't even have to have all the answers about whatever it is that we're facing. That we can move the energy field from fear over to love, which allows us to be open and receptive to the answers that are just waiting. They're waiting to flow through. But fear closes the door. Fear says, no risk. Fear will tell you, well, look how that worked out in the past when you took risk. It'll tell you all the scary stories of anything that ever happened when you took a risk. What it doesn't tell you is that fear asks you to crawl back in your hole. Fear asks you, shine? Fear says, who do you think you are? Shine? Fear says, just carry on with status quo. Fear says, this is good enough. Fear says, I have to fight for what I get. Fear says, someone is trying to do something to me. Fear has no answers for the future. Fear is about the past. Fear is who you think you are. If it weren't true that you are actually an expression of this nature of unconditional love. And I'm going to even, in that definition, go so far as saying, you are God. You have been created in the image and the likeness of this one power and presence. And being willing to be vulnerable, being willing to live in the realm of uncertainty, allows you options. It allows so many th for you to be able to explore so many things and opportunities and possibilities of your life. It allows you to connect with this creative power that responds to your belief about what you are worthy of. And the life that your heart wants to live. So I want to ask each one of you to take a moment now. And I, I'd like you to close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. Let go of everything that is, I've been saying. And ask 
your spirit, your soul, your heart, to bring forward in your imagination the situation and the circumstances in your life that you feel love right now in your life. And notice how that feels to you. It could be a relationship. It could be a garden. It could be some creative adventure that you're doing. Something, it can be something ever so simple. And notice now in your physical body, as you feel that, that love that you're experiencing, notice where in your physical body you're feeling that. Probably not in your head. Whenever you're ready, open your eyes. So where did you where did you feel it in your body in your heart hmm. and some of you are just putting your hands over your heart interesting huh and of course the heart center within within our physical body within our chakras is much more than just the organ of the heart and it's no accident that the heart chakra is in the middle of the upper and the lower chakras. And that actually it starts in the heart. And since I mentioned earlier that Jesus was this uh, spiritual psychology, he understood spiritual psychology. Uh, today we might call it holistic And he was asked by many of the religious leaders of his time, which of the commandments, which of the Ten Commandments is most important? And he answered, and you shall love the Lord your God. The Lord your God, meaning the indwelling God, your higher wisdom self. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, this is really, really fascinating when you break it down to what we know today. And I'm sure that they were smarter back then than we think that, that the average person was. But to love, I mean, there's a science to the order of these things. To love God with all your heart with your emotions. So I think that, you know, it's probably safe to say for each one of you, when, when you visualize where in my life am I, am I experiencing love, the warmth, the safety of love, the good feelings of love, where am I experiencing that? That that is an emotion. It has an emotion attached, attached to it. So to love God, to love this divine presence that is the very essence, invisible and visible, 
of all that is seen and unseen, to love ourselves, to know that we're in unity with that produces a feeling. And that's why our affirmative prayer work always begins with recognizing that there's one infinite power, one intelligence, one love, one truth, one wholeness, one goodness. It is that out of which I have been created. And it is the qualities and the attributes of what I am. Love, peace, beauty, joy, harmony, life, creativity, freedom, prosperity, abundance. God is, I am. So my emotions are activated in what I want to see happen in my life. To love God with all my heart, to love God with all my soul, every aspect of my being, my spiritual being, nothing left out. To love God with all of my mind. Can you love with your mind without any emotion? Not very well. Not very expressive. Not very good feeling. So he didn't say, with all of your mind and then all of your heart. He said, with all of your heart and then everything else. And when our heart and our spirit are engaged, our mind, the analytical part of ourselves, becomes spiritualized. It knows how to think, right? Not what to think, it knows how to think. Think is love. Think as wholeness. Think as peace. Think as beauty. Think as joy. Holistic. And the emotions help us when our mind wants to go somewhere else. When our mind wants to be lazy. When our mind says, no, I just want to bitch and complain. When our mind says, no, I don't want to do my spiritual practice. I'm hungry. I'm tired. When our mind says, but look what's happening. Mind. Unspiritualized. Forgetting who it is who and what you are. And then, with all of our strength, and let's not kid ourselves, this is not easy peasy. But when we start with saying, love the God of my own understanding, Love the God that is love. Build my faith on that. Through my heart, I become softer, more flexible, more creative, more happy, more willing to be, as Brene Brown says, vulnerable, to know that mistakes are I tried, and that I learned, and that I have now have something else. To know that I'm a bridge builder, not easy. And in, in finishing this, I want to emphasize this idea of it's not just the mind and what we're thinking by sharing with you um, a quote from Catherine Ponder, and some of you may know of her as a great metaphysical teaching and prosperity and abundance. There, she writes, there are those people who read self-help books and take numerous success courses. 
who get the idea that mind power is all there is. That if they just use their mental power sufficiently, everything will come their way. For a time, they seem to be right. They can produce tremendous results through the power of thought and through using mind techniques. However, the time usually comes, though, that they finally realize that mind power is not enough, and they begin to spin their wheels spiritually. This is not a mind game. This is first and foremost a heart game, a love game, a shine your light game, a vulnerable game. Are you up to it? Because this is what we need to be good stewards of our planet and to know what is ours to do rather than what our mind thinks that we should do. So I invite you to just close your eyes again for a moment and to return to that place of love with inside yourself. And I'm going to ask you four simple questions and give you a moment in between to just see what comes up for you. And these are four questions about vulnerability from Brene Brown. One of the qualities of being vulnerable. Can you stay in tough things when they get uncomfortable and awkward, or do you tap out? She calls this rumbling with vulnerability. Can you stay in tough things when they get uncomfortable and awkward, or do you tap out? Number two, are you clear about what your values are, and have you operationalized those into behaviors? Do you know what behaviors support your values and what behaviors don't? This tells us where we are in living with our values. Are you ready to brave trust? Can you build trust and be trustworthy? And lastly, learn how to rise. People, she says, are more willing to be courageous up front if they know how to rise. And so I just share with you that in closing that everything that we are dealing with life in, about, calls us to be more love, calls us to shine, calls us to take risk, calls us to be more exposed about the things that matter to us, our values, who we are, and that it is important to realize that there, this is not an easy road and that there are many, many ways for us to support ourselves in this process. And building spiritual community is one, one of those ways. So let your light shine and enjoy it because it looks great on every single one of you. And so it is. Thank you.